Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to yet another edition of Soul Talk. Soul Talk, as you're aware, is a program in which we talk to mainstream leaders about their values, their beliefs, their influences and those inspiring role models that have brought them to their level of excellence. Today, we have an extremely gifted individual to talk with. Poet, writer, playwright, scholar, activist, actor, director. He is a multifaceted master of the creative arts. He is also one of India's contemporary leading literary voices. Welcome, Girish Karnad. Thank you. Soul Thank Talk. you very much, Vikram. Nice to be here. Over 11, 12 plays, 10 numerous awards, many, many creative and literary achievements. Mm. And yet you grew up in Mathuran, in, in, in a Maharashtra. I was only born, born in, in Mathuran. Uh, Maharashtran speaking area. Then you Pune moved to Dharwad for your graduation, then, which again was in English. You, then you did a master's. You were a Rhodes Scholar. And you went to uh, the Oxford for your master's in philosophy, politics, and economics, again, all in English. And yet, you chose to write all your prolific literature in Canada. Tell us all about that. Well, let me first make one or two corrections. I'm not a poet, unfortunately. I wish I was a poet. And my, I had a heartbreak when I suddenly realized that I can't write poetry. This was the age of about 22, because that's what I always wanted to do. To answer your question uh, as to why I write in Canada, it was uh, I did my schooling in Canada. Uh, and I was in Sirsi for a long time, which is a Canada-speaking area. I was in Dharawar for a long time, which is a Canada-speaking area. And although my medium of instruction in college was English, you know, one continued to read and write in Canada. But the interesting thing is, when I wrote my first play, it came out in Canada. That's it. Till that moment, I thought I was going to be a poet, and a poet in English. And that's why I said, you know, I, I wanted to go abroad. I want to settle down in England and be after Eliot. Yates, Girish Karnad, you know. Tell me, when you were a growing boy, did you, and you were impressed with street theater, uh, village theater, I understand. Did you always know your direction? Or did it happen much no, later? No, no. I, I was fascinated by theater. There's no question at all. Because there were two kinds of theater that I grew up in. One was the, the touring company theaters, which were popular in those days, which my parents had seen in Marathi in its heyday, you know, Balgandhar and others, about which I had heard. And then there was a folk play, Yakshagana and so on, which I saw. Uh, both of which acted upon my mind, I suppose. But I loved them. To me, uh, to, uh, you know, every time I think of my childhood, it's the theatre. But I didn't at that time think I would go into theatre. I didn't think of anything. I, mean, I just loved but it. But creative arts as well? I mean, were you asked to be a doctor or I an wanted engineer? To be a, no, I wanted to be an IAS officer. And ah. My father wanted me to be an IAS officer because he always felt that was the ultimate in life. You became an IAS officer. You had achieved it. You know, he, he came from a, a rather poorer cl uh, class, this lower middle class. And to him, security uh, was very important. And I think he was heartbroken when he realized, and I realized that I was not going to do IAS and went abroad instead. So your choice of a literary career uh, has been a great loss to our bureauc bureaucratic uh, uh, structure, I would imagine. Well, as I said, it just happened. I mean, one day I just wrote a play and I wrote it in Canada and there was such conviction in my writing there um, that I knew I was not a poet, you know, because I wrote poetry with great effort and, you know, each poem took... Uh, but this po uh, play, just here, he just poured out. But your stint at, at Rhodes, which was around the time you were inspired to write Yayati. After. Yes, I know. Mm -hmm. But the process of creative churning must have started while you were there. Because no. You, you wrote I that in 61. and you 60 to 63. I wrote yes. this in 60. Yes. The point is I wrote this play uh, when I was still in India before going. And oh. I showed it to a Canada publisher who returned it to me. And then when I was in England, I thought of putting it into English. Uh, I couldn't. I just couldn't think, rethink the play into English. And suddenly I got a letter one day from my publisher saying, please send it to me, I'll publish it. And I did. You're on record to saying that when you wrote Yayati, you felt as if you were a chosen scribe, as if, uh, you, as if there was, uh, your pen was moving, you, there was a mystical inspiration yeah. to write this mythological drama. H how did that happen? Uh, the process was just an ecstatic process. It just poured out. I could see them on stage and I, I, I was like a stenotypist writing down whatever they were saying. Um, it's a process which I have never been able to uh, recapture again. After that, playwriting has always been rather difficult. But the first play, it just came out. 
Uh, one of the reasons why I think it happened is that after Sirsi and so on, uh, the first place, uh, the place I went to school in is a place called Sirsi in Karnataka, which had no electricity, you know, so one or two ramshackle cinema houses. But I saw a lot of theatre. And because there was no electricity, the day used to come to an end very early. And children used to get together and tell each other stories. At home, you were told stories. There were grandmothers telling stories. If a teacher didn't come, one of us was made to tell stories. We lived in an atmosphere where stories just uh, filled the air. And many of them were, of course, Puranic stories, you know, stories of gods and uh, epics and so on. So I think it, uh, it was just there sitting in, inside me, and I hadn't realized it was there. And it just, it, I tapped but, it and uh, it came. How did Tughlaq happen? I had written Yayati, it had been received well. My publisher was saying, give me another play. I didn't know what to write. And I read a book of Kannada uh, 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 criticism in which the critic, a famous critic called Kirtanath Kurtkuti wrote that in Kannada there are no good historical plays. That Kannada playwrights don't know how to write history meaningfully, that we have nothing equivalent to you know, um, Richard the Third, say, or you know. and I said, why not? So I took up a book of textbook of history, went through it from page one, Mohenjo-daro. I started and went on reading. And when I came to Tughlaq, I said, that's it. That's an interesting character. Now I must work on it. And then I was at Oxford, and I worked solidly. I worked, collected facts. I read every book on Tughlaq. I read Burney. I read Ibn Battuta. I read contemporary writers. Collected facts and wrote the play. Earlier, growing years. The parental influences. The main influence on me, looking back on my career, was their passion for theatre. You know, they loved theatre. And my father had worked in the old Bombay state, so he had worked in Bombay, he had worked in Sindh, he had seen the old Parsi theatre. You know, he remembered uh, all the uh, adaptations of Othello and so on. He, he had seen the Urdu plays done. My mother had seen Bal Gandharv, she used to I mimic him and so on. So, in our house, right from childhood, there was this feeling that theatre is uh, an enjoyable and valuable experience. And, it was an and I was seeing plays all the time. And it was an essential part of your dining room conversation, so that in some oh way yes, would have oh yes, influenced yes. you to, to yes, proceed yes. in that yes. direction. And you know, my father was a doctor. He was a lower division doctor. So that whenever these actors used to come to a place like Sirsi, which was a malarial place in those days, you know, famous as a punishment post, the, among the people invited to the play, one was a doctor free of charge, you know, there was of course the Mamledar and the police officer, they all got free passes to, and my father was one of them. And so we all got free passes. I mean, you know, it was the done thing. Now it seems quite horrendous that we all went and saw play after play after play without paying for it, but that was the style. But the net result was that I saw lots of plays and I knew the actors and um, theatre got into my blood without my realising it. So after your return from England, you joined the Oxford Uni University Press. Yes. And the success of Yayati and Tughlaq then spurred you on to be a full-time uh, playwright. I wasn't a full-time playwright ever, ever, ever. I worked with Oxford University Press for seven years, which was a great experience because, you know, then you're in touch with books. Uh, uh, while I was there, I wrote Hayavadana. Um, um, what happened is, at, after the, at the end of seven years, I got uh, the Homi Bhabha Fellowship which allowed me two years to go and study folk theatre. During that time, the idea of Hayavadan came, I wrote the play, uh, you know, and um, so it was a very conscious decision to write a folk play because I felt that that aspect of our heritage had not been used. You know, people were still doing drawing room plays all the time and um, to have music in theatre was considered absolutely, you know, not, not acceptable and so on. So I said, why not? So. Um, I wrote Hayavadan and, and so on. And then came a, a long gap when I got into Hindi films and so on. Uh, when I wrote plays but not very good ones and... Well, you acted in a few Hindi films. I've seen oh, you romancing a few, a few Hollywood, uh, Bollywood oh, yes. heroines with, oh, yes. with some deft ease. Yes. Well, I, I, there was always pressure on me to sort of, you know, to go and act in Hindi films. But the fact remains that I proposed to my wife and I said to her, I hope you have money. She is a doctor in America. She said, no, but she said, I thought you had money. So I said, oh my God, I don't have money. I must come make money now. And I got into Hindi films to make money. And then I pursued money quite single-mindedly. But next few I years. understand it was only as a means to be able to be a serious playwright. There were a few films which one thinks back with pleasure. I mean, and I, I'll always enjoy working with Sham Benegal, for instance. I'll always enjoy Great doing director. Swami. Uh, month and you know there were a few stunt films which turned out to be great fun. There were a few moments, but I was not a confirmed actor. 
how did this sort of gradual journey and metamorphosis to so many different aspects of the creative arts happen? I was very lucky to be a part of my generation. Let me put it this way. I think my whole generation was lucky because I was 10 when India became independent. And by the, by the time I was 20, 25, opportunities were opening out. You know, my yes. return to India was a great stroke of luck, really. Uh, I, I missed my first class at Oxford just by a small margin and you know I, I felt tragic but looking back that was the luckiest thing to have happened because then I came back home and anyway I was writing in Canada and you know India was just opening out there was in film Satyatra had just come you know 54, 55, Pather Panchali the whole exciting thing in the 60s Al Qazi had started there was a cultural to, renaissance the complete renaissance uh, with independence culture was being looked at there was money television hadn't yet come mind you so that you know the evenings the people were willing to come and see what you're doing uh, and 20 25 years of absolute uh, you know i let rip actually but you had you had great success as a playwright several of your plays were translated into the english language they've been performed by leading international companies in the west mm -hmm. and yet it seems that you have deliberately psychologically distanced yourself from doing anything among the international milieu and chosen deliberately to write upon the Indian milieu. Theatre is always for a specific rooted audience. You know, it does not transfer well. Tom Stoppard is now considered a great, uh, you know, very important playwright in um, uh, England. But, you know, none of his plays would work here, I think. Uh, you know. Well, they've tried. But they've tried, but they don't. I mean, they've tried it in English. They wouldn't work it in, in regional languages, you see. Um, some plays do. I mean, but Lorca travels. L Lorca, Lorca's plays do go down well, but no. So, the reason is ultimately theater is aimed at a particular culturally rooted audience and you've got to remember to write for that audience otherwise it's not Trump. And are you a, a very fulfilled playwright? Well I've been very lucky because of the period you know my plays have been done by some of the best uh, directors in India of the period you know it was done by Satyadev Dubey, Alkazi, yeah, Al uh, you know Alec Shaman Padamsi Anjalan, um, uh, Alec Padamsi, in English. That, yes and uh, some of the best actors of the period have acted in my plays so I couldn't have asked for more theatre wise you know I'm, um, everyone from Om Shupuri to Nasiruddin Shah and you know they, they all acted uh, and Yes, I think um, I have been very fortunate. This may be a historical accident also because in the 50s and the 60s there was a great deal of cooperation between people. We all used to, uh, you know, translate. I, I translated Tendulkar, I translated yes. Badal Sarkar, you know, things like that. But you never lived in Bombay at any given period of time where, which was then. When I decided to go into Hindi films, I did. You then did for a while. Then I was there for. And your wife Saraswati was with you at that stage? No, then, then we got married. Oh, it was once, once I thought I had enough money, we got married. Yeah. And then she came. And you have two children. Yes. Yes. Yeah, no. uh, where are they? Are they following their parental? Influences? No, absolutely. There are no parental injunctions. As I said, whether in religion or in life, we have not told them. You know, I hope we have been good parents. That's all we can say. That's for them. Because to you've say. been a very private person. You have kept a certain boundary about yes, your private life. My is my that is that yes, again deliberate yes, choice? Yeah, absolutely. I didn't want to expose. I didn't want. The fa I, I was in. A, I know. I knew. I was in a medium which got was very glamorous and can get exposure. I didn't want my children to be. But you stayed away. You shied away from publicity yes. because you have. You are again on record to say that it in interferes with the creative process. Yes, also, I, I didn't want it to impinge on my children. I wanted them to grow up as normal children, where they saw me as a person who went and you know earned money and came back and I kept saying just because my photograph is on the poster I don't think it's, it's so you encouraged them to make their own choices they have all gone into different things and and made their own choices so you didn't nurture them. you don't think children need nurturing and they make the wrong choice we nurtured them to be independent you nurtured them <laughs> yes I think so would you call yourself a, a fulfilled and successful parent well let me say this my daughter is a doctor she's 25 26 uh, in England my son is a journalist here uh, and they come home for their holidays. So I suppose I would, you know, they, they have the independence to go anywhere in the world. They have the means also. But they come and spend some time with me and my wife. Uh, so I, I suppose they enjoy being with us. The sense I get <coughs> from you is that there is a strong sense of activis <coughs> activism within you, which you have deliberately restrained. I have not restrained it at all. In fact, I have been very active in certain kind of politics. I have always felt that I have been very fortunate 
in the kind of honors I've got, awards I've got, recognition I've got, and therefore I owe it to my country that I, I participate in issues that matter to me. And certainly in the whole question of communalism and communal politics, and you know, I have been very active and I've had stones thrown at my windows, windows smashed, all that's happened to me. I've had police sitting in front of me to protect me from uh, you know, goons and so on. But I, I f really feel that uh, um, secularism is the great uh, legacy that we have and we need to fight for it. It's very sad that in the last 10, 15 years it's got weakened and you know there have been forces which have eaten away at it and uh, made the country a dangerous place and I would certainly uh, fight for to maintain it. But are there other issues beyond that? Environmental degradation? I have, I mean, you know, there I have not taken the lead. I've certainly got, I mean, you know, certainly in freedom of expression, like what happened in Sayajara University, you know, recently the um, goons coming into the uh, MS Baroda uh, in, school yes. and, you know, b b wrecking the uh, art exhibition and so on. No, that kind of thing one has protested, gone out, or, you know, the hounding of uh, Hussein. Yes. That goes on. No, that kind of issue is certainly the, the upset one. Tell us about Broken Images and, and the wedding album. What no, the Broken Images is really when I came back from England, I was there for two or three years uh, working for the government of India as a, as a culture minister. And I came back and I suddenly, coming to uh, 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 Bangalore, I was suddenly struck by how much the image mattered today in our life. Everywhere there were images, there were electronic images, there were posters, but uh, all kinds of uh, things, but essentially, the TV image, the video image, you know, and um, and I felt that these images were shaping our own idea of uh, our idea of ourselves. And broken images is really about a woman who becomes internationally famous by writing in English. The question that you yes, asked, yes, uh, an international celebrity, and, uh, and suddenly is, is uh, cross-examined by her own television image. So that that's and wedding album is uh, wedding album is something that I have been writing for a long time. Uh, it's uh, it's only about a wedding in the family and you know the pressures that work. Did you not find that cinema is more powerful a medium? Did you not feel like doing more work as a director? Ultimately, it's a question of conviction. You know, when I if you said to me, I, when I look at any of the films I have done, I, I s notice so many things that are wrong. You know, and I feel no, no, I didn't do that right. I didn't. Do. But with my plays, even with the Ayati, when I read it, I feel that's good actually. It's not bad. I mean, for a 22-year-old, I had a good right. sense of how to write a play. So that kind of confidence that you are at something that you're good at, I, I don't get in films. I do. I made films. I don't get that with my acting either. I've acted. But, but the experience of being an actor, the experience of being a director, would have helped you evolve as a better playwright. Oh, would, yes. Is, Infinitely, because uh, films teach you to be brief. Films teach you to cut, you know, because editing is the ultimate, um, you know, the, the, so you the, make the your scenes vocabulary. Tighter. Your scenes tighter and, you know, Cohesion. when you're said all that you need to say to cut to something else, you know, cut to another scene quickly, get on with it. Oh, oh yes, the the uh, impact of films on my plays is enormous. I would say. And you you mentioned earlier that for you playwriting is hard work. It's not that you get a brilliant idea and it all. You have to work hard at producing a play. Yes, I mean I have worked for thirty five years on my fire and the rain. Uh, the idea stuck me when I was uh, in my twenties, and I wrote the play about ten years ago. And I was working all the time. I was trying to find out how one could do it, how one could weave into it, what are the possibilities. Uh, uh, you know, because the marvelous thing about theater is its limitations. You know, because you have to say everything you say in two hours. In fact, nowadays it's even less, say 90 minutes. And within that 90 minutes, if you have bored the audience, the bored audience will get up and go. And you know, the, even our muscles of our bottom, you know, yeah, can't take can't very take long, so much longer. So there you are. And can you hold, hold attention theater. for those two hours? And can, can you say something significant? Those limitations I find extremely challenging. And now even more difficult because now you have television yes, overtaking sir. your entire mind attention. Quite but right. there is this much is made of conflict between theatre and television. I still feel that television could also be a great medium to promote theatre. Yes, and unfortunately m so much of our television is so bad that it doesn't stop It doesn't do that. But it doesn't stop people from but coming. But do you think that we could improve theatre through the medium of television? Well, I don't know. You know, the point is the fact that there is television in the West hasn't killed theatre. You know, uh, you know theatre continues. 
uh, how to make con uh, theater prosper is another yes. question. You know, we have to go into the mechanics of it. But the point is, in 19th century, there was only folk theater. Then we got company theaters. Then uh, in the 30s, we got films. You know, the number of, um, then, you know, uh, came television. Then there's video. And so the number of art forms is proliferating. And the, it's available. It's reaching further. And I don't regret that because, you know, uh, uh, I think television and video goes to people who could never dream of coming to theatre, who couldn't afford theatre. Women, servants, people who are in bed, bedridden people, you know, yes. uh, were, were menials. So, you know, and I think uh, I wouldn't regret television at all because they entertain people who had no entertainment before. Uh, yeah. But you, you are, I can see that you still remain very involved with the physical interaction on stage. Oh, yes. You feel that's an exciting that, process. That's, that's what makes theatre. That's, that's what makes theatre. And are you are you satisfied with where Indian theatre is today? No, I'm not. That I'm not. Of what, course, we are what, going. What, what you see, the only theatre, only language in which theatre is really alive today is Marathi. The sign of a, a theatre which is alive, I would say, two signs. One is that young people should be writing plays, and young people should be watching plays. You know, both of which happens in M Maharashtra, I find. Um, this is not happening in Karnataka and it's happening even less in other languages. But you've been fairly aligned with the cre uh, cultural forces in the country. You had a stint as the director of the at, at the center in London. Hmm. What can the uh, private-public partnership do to improve theatre in India? Well, it, theatre, as I said, ultimately is rooted in a particular audience. And what, will, what makes theatre run in London is not the same thing that makes it run in Bombay or would make it run in Dharwad, you know. We, e in each case, we have to look at it as a specific rooted problem and carry on. Cultural vision for India in the future. What do you think those who aspire to be part of the cultural direction of this country, what is the message you have for the I people? think we have a most marvelous constitution. I think our constitution makers had a tremendous vision uh, among all our neighbors, we are one country which has survived as democracy. I mean, you know, someone like Nehru could have become a dictator, who knows, but he didn't. We could have become a Hindu state, we didn't. I think th they said we could have become a monolithic state, but the, you know, the linguistic reorganization of India was a marvelous move. Uh, we are a federal, um, although it was not intended to be probably, and a very forth, um, uh, uh, a, a dynamic society. And I, th I think we could go on. Unfortunately, all this, um, uh, you know, looking backwards, bringing up Hindu culture in the false name, you know, trying to build up it's the uh, religious uh, intolerance for political reasons. And these are the people who are also wrecking um, uh, the democratic uh, framework of the country, which, which worries me. It's not the grassroots people that worry me. It's the people who do this, and these kind of people are educated politicians who should know better. But they there must be some people from your culture, uh, contemporary milieu with whom you're satisfied, whom you feel have contributed to the richness of your own creativity. Are there any? Oh, I have been so fortunate. The number of people I've worked with, as I told you, in, in films, Sham Benegal, Vijay Tendulkar, you know, to have a colleague like Vijay Tendulkar, Badal Sarkar, um, you know, or to have acted with a person called Shabana Azmi or Smita Patil. What is the future for Girish Karnad that we can look forward to? I hope for something better. That I'll come up with something better than what I've done so far. That's what uh, one always is looking to the uh, next thing. That's and what. the idea of writing something with the global milieu does still not excite you. One may. There's no such thing as it doesn't. Because there's I know no, the world is integrating. No, no. You see, you see, because uh, anything can happen. That's the thing. And one should allow it to happen. One should allow the alternatives to come up and, you know, uh, g give one a choice. It's been a pleasure, Girish, to have you on Soul Talk. For me too. Thank and, you. And I hope the audience enjoyed listening to Mr. Girish Karnad as much as I enjoyed talking to the master of the creative arts. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.